Breaking the crack. Good day, I guess, Sarah, to you, because I guess it's still the evening for you and morning for me. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Ross. How are you doing? I, great. Great. Never better. You know, I'm wearing my blue today, I guess. I didn't realize how much I enjoyed the color blue, but today must be one of those days that I'm committed to my color. So I was telling my daughter when we were traveling the other weekend, I was like, if you just look at people, you can actually see their spirit color or their aura color and there's pinks and yellows and everything. So mine must be blue. I, don't, I haven't like researched what the aura of blue is, but I wear a lot of blue. It's a strong color, Russ. Suits you. What's your color? I know you wear a lot of, a lot of red. Well, I wear a lot of red for my branding, but I wear turquoise a lot. I think turquoise. We're blue, both blue people. Yeah, we're both blue people. Um, so, Sarah, we have a wonderful guest today, uh, still on our anti-aging longevity track. We're, we're meeting some of the best scientists and specialists in the field. Who do we have today? Today we have uh, Anders, who's going to talk to us about monitoring tech. Welcome, Anders. It's no, so nice to meet you. It's very rare that we have someone on that we don't actually know uh, yeah. in person. Uh, Thank you. So it's fabulous for you to come on. We're really looking forward to hearing all about your technology because we're we're into the, to the self-measurement. We're into quantified self. Yeah. Uh, and really, like, like Russ said to you before, we're, we're trying to focus on longevity. And we know, you know, unless you measure it, you just don't know. Um, so please feel free to give a little bit of background about yourself so that, so that we can learn it too. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, so my name is Anders Merman. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Swedish consumer health tech startup Diversify. And um, personally, I'm a trained physicist. I have a master of science in engineering physics, and I worked all my life in medical technologies, building products, world-class products, really, for, for specialized medicine and selling to hospitals and installing and getting them to cure people around the world. I did that for yeah, since 1992, and um, uh, primarily in radiation therapy of cancer. So I worked 21 years in that field. and. Um, then I got headhunted to become CTO at Aerocrine, which were building, we were building breathalyzers for nitric oxide to detect the degree of inflammatory asthma in your bronchial tree in parts per billion. Very precise instrument. And then I got into a little bit more breathalyzers and biomarkers, uh, particularly non-invasive biomarkers and whatever molecules you could capture in breath, in exhaled breath. Um, and um, fast forward to six years ago, we founded the company. And uh, I've been working uh, here as a CEO, trying to struggle with the startup world uh, since. But uh, it's nothing I regret. Absolutely. Yeah. Not. yeah, I've been in the startup world many times. It's uh, as a as a co-founder and and uh, and it's 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 hard, but the reward is there. I'm sure you can see it, right? You can see the light. It's just uh, mired. It's a long in... tunnel, yeah. But uh, you can see the light. <laughs> it's a long Absolutely. tunnel. Yeah. And and is and this is something you're um, selling direct to consumers, or are you uh, working with partners and hospitals and doctors? No, uh, I got tired of working with partners and hospitals and uh, and selling to them. It's very long, you know, selling cycles and a long validation. And and uh, I guess you are as well as me. I'm not a friend of uh, of uh, Western medicine in that sense. We're not working too little on prevention. We're working too little on uh, on. Uh, you know, we have this controversial idea that lifestyle diseases are best treated with lifestyle changes, not drugs. I don't know why it's controversial. It's controversial in Sweden, and I'm sure it's in, in Britain and in, in even in California, too. So, um, yeah, we're going to the grassroots movements. We're selling to biohackers, but also to people, particularly then our first product, Ace Track, which measures if you're in ketosis in a non-invasive and very precise way. Uh, you know, selling that a lot to people with mental uh, health problems, with um, certainly obesity, diabetes type two, people that really need help and need help to make their lifestyle changes work. Uh, uh, I know we're going to talk about longevity. I'm an expert now on premature death, so we can talk about that too. But you know, if you don't die prematurely, I'm sure you will live long, and that's really what our focus is not necessarily on the hundred years old people. I love those people too, but we are trying to save those that actually die before 70. Uh, and that doesn't. Matter. 
and it, it's it's interesting because the differences between Sarah and 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 me in our intrinsic and extrinsic aging scores is the fact that I had. Uh, not really childhood, but in my twenties, I had cancer. Sarah, Sarah's been on the track for a while, right? She's been on a healthy track for a while. Uh, I'm just getting started. This is like my, my only my fourth year working with Sarah, where I'm like actually thinking about taking care of myself and not four children or obsessing over the cancer I had. And I, and I wonder when you know for your device, we haven't really talked about what are you actually measuring and what are you looking for, uh, and and what are the markers you're looking for. Yeah, so we have this uh, device. I'm showing it in the picture here now. It's called X-Track. It's a breathalyzer in one breath, uh, a controlled breath where you, uh, at the same time as you breathe, you watch your screen on your phone to make sure that you exhale with the same pressure over six seconds and sample from the bottom of your lungs. We detect the level of acetone in your breath in parts per million. And... Um, uh, we're really the only breathalysis on the world market for acetone now, right now that are measuring in the real unit for physical units of that parts per million. And if that number is high, you have been in ketosis about 10 to 60 minutes ago. So you can really see if you've done the right thing the night before, the morning after. For me personally, if I have a high value, yeah, I know I did everything right. And I've learned for the last couple of years, I can't eat anything after nine o'clock. Uh, then I'm out. Then all you know, all night, my insulin levels and everything will go haywire. But if I, I've learned by having this device personally that for me, with this is very individual. For me, I have to have a long fasting window uh, during night, and then I can be in ketosis in the morning. For example, even even if you're just eating fat, even if you're just eating fat. Yeah, absolutely. I can still not eat late in the evening. I, I, I need to combine in my case, and I think that goes for many middle-aged people. Most of our customers are middle-aged women, actually, um, uh, here in Sweden. Uh, for them, you know, they've been yo-yo yo banting all their life, and they are getting all these kind of vague symptoms, uh, anti-immune symptoms, a number of different things, and, and you don't really think the diet may necessarily have very much to do with it. You know, may not even be overweight, but it does. And, and for middle-aged people, it's important to have a long fasting window every day, preferably only like two meals per day. And that, that goes for me too. Although I've been healthy, like you, Sarah, all my life. So I'm not doing it from a personal experience by saying, yeah. No, but but I do, I'm doing it from personal experience, but I do know that I have a much better metabolic flexibility now since I started working on this than I ever have. Yeah, that's a, that's a kind of a, a key word right now, isn't it? Metabolic flexibility. A lot of, you know, in the biohacking circles, a lot of people are aiming for that rather than maybe just being totally um, carnivore or totally keto all the time. Having a metabolic flexibility where your body is able to utilize carbs, sometimes is able to utilize fats. Yeah. We're evolutionary built to, we're the best omnivore on the planet. And we're, you, we weren't built to have uh, regular meals in the same hour every day, lunch, and evening. And, and we're certainly not built to eat the same things all the time. We had to eat whatever scavengers uh, that we were, we could find. Whatever's in my pantry is basically where I'm at these days. No, not whatever's in your pantry, right? <laughs> I know you can um, put butter and Doritos in there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm coming from this from the perspective of uh, I I'm still just getting started on a lot of uh, a lot of these, and especially with 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 keto. Um, and I'm curious with your device, how do you couple that up with? like the beginners and getting started i i would love to try the device i'm not in ketosis i know that because i know my my diet is not very good right now sir don't judge um but uh, but i'm curious um how, you know how do you couple it with kind of the getting started beginners uh you know in, in ketosis and in, in, in the keto diet yeah this is a product that actually turns to both the the, the hardcore biohackers that just want to compare it uh, with um, with blood sampling and measuring blood ketones with, with a prick your finger and have a, a ketone strip and all of that and you we, we we sell the products to them too and eventually they will replace that because it's you know it's, it's actually a much better deal and and better. you will yeah. actually see more things uh, momentously uh, with Ace Track, you can measure like ten times a day if you want. It's, it's completely non-invasive and inexpensive. Yeah. 
and and we've talked to several of our guests use your device and have talked about your device and talked about actually using the breath uh and say it they prefer it um and 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 I, I I agree. I I hate the finger prick. Uh, we've had to do several of them, and I all my fingers are now pricked, and I'm like I'm still not getting a drop of blood. Uh, that says something else about me, I'm sure. But. but but to a newbie, I would say it is also a good product because it's it's gamified, and you can just get started. You will have low values for weeks and weeks, but then suddenly one day you will have you have under ten parts per million for weeks. Every morning you measure, and then one morning you will have fifty. And then you realize, wow, what did I differently yesterday than I didn't do all the other days? Maybe it's just because your insulin resistance has become good. Maybe it's just luck. But if you measure 52 days in a row, two mornings in a row, hmm, well, that's that's really the lifestyle tool that you need to make to to get you know promoted to uh, to get mentally charged with yes you know you you, get, you you will get a number it's like a step counter you, you something like you you uh, our users you know want to do 10,000 steps or whatever this is um this is a, a po- positive measure but of course you're not going to sell uh, a track and have them understand uh, to, to, to the man on the street, if they don't know what keto is, then there is no point of having this device. You need to know a little bit about it, and then you maybe don't want to go to blood sampling, uh, but you want to try. You know, it could be worthwhile to try it. Yeah, and and there's um, something to be said about the the biohacker and quantifying yourself. And and Sarah and I have talked about this for several years, and it is the number one thing around around being, you know, having the agency of taking care of yourself. Uh, and I can tell you my example is sleep where I was a terrible sleeper. Uh, we talked to a few guests about the, you know, the power and, and importance of sleep, got the aura ring. I can tell you pretty much what my score is going to be the minute I wake up and how I feel. I'm like, I think I'm going to be a 70 today because I slept terribly. My dog was up all night throwing up. I think I'm going to have a low score, but I, but I do know the, how important it is. And I think it's the importance of having the right kind of diet to couple that with health and well-being and getting started. And the gamification is important. I, I, I've, there's so many apps that I've used that the gamification allowed me to kind of grow, especially with meditation. And some of the meditation apps are really good at that as well. So um, I'm excited. I'm really excited to use it. Actually, uh, I met a Finn at the Biohacker Summit in Amsterdam in, in October. And and he he really liked uh, and you know that aura ring is Finnish. Uh, anyway, he said that yeah, I think Ace Track is the aura ring for metabolism, and that was a that was a that was a good n- nice thing to say. I, I'm not yeah, sure that's an accolade it, coming from a Finn too. Yeah, from a Finn too. So that's uh, that's uh, that's well, we're, we're trying to be that. And and again, metabolism uh, to be a little bit more serious. A lot of our users believe they are in ketosis while they are in starvation there's no real you can't really tell by the feeling it feels like you have a runner's high or it feels like it's the same but you, your brain i usually say that our brain is a greedy banker and it doesn't want to release fat at all because the evolutionary we built and the brain is wired to make itself survive eventually if everything else is lost and there's no food for months and months and months it'll have to the brain will have to survive on the last fat you have uh, so it's not going to release the fat very easily you might as well just as well sacrifice muscle uh, proteins and convert that into glucose and that's called starvation uh, but the feeling of being a starvation rather than in ketosis or just fasting you can't really tell except that you're oozing acetone and that's what we measure so I'm interested to know, and and I, I know that we maybe we can talk a little bit about your competitors, but I've got um, Lumen and Food Marble, which are measuring different things, I believe. So, Food Marble's measuring hydrogen, hydrogen and and the methane actually. So, hydrogen and methane, and then the Lumen's measuring is it carbon dioxide? Yeah, it measures carbon dioxide and I maybe I think uh, oxygen as well on. Uh, on uh, exhalation and uh, inhalation and exhalation you have a special breath technique in the lumen so um yeah so, so you, you want me to an, an, an answer them they're, they're the breathalyzers you I'm know they are well i'm just wondering what the comparison is because i have both of them and and i sporadically use them because i don't i don't do a keto diet mainly i mean i'm actually very i'm a, a bit of a carb 
fanatic, which I try to every now and then I, uh, I switch to doing like a more high fat diet, but, but I actually kind of seem to do fairly well on a reasonably high carb diet. So, so there's two questions there. One is kind of what is your device measuring compared to some of these other ones? And two, when do you really think people need to start look really kind of focusing on being in ketosis? Uh, let's start with, with sorting out our you know, competitors and everything else. We're measuring acetone. There are a few others, uh, the three others on the, on the world market right now. And there used to be another European one. And the first one on the market was Ketonics. It was also a Swedish device. They're not, they're not doing really well at this point. And there are two American ones. Uh, the big best one of those is called Biosense, only sold in the US, uh, not, not in Europe. Uh, and Kato is another one. And then there's the South uh, Korean one called Ketoscan. And there's a few others, you know, that are not really uh, up with part of these. Uh, and they all measure acetone in one way or another. Uh, we do it, uh, we think, uh, most repeatability, with the highest repeatability and highest accuracy. Um, and uh, particularly we divided the markets with one Asian, one American, one European. So that's nice. Um, Lumen, uh, Lumen measures the what's called this direct fat burning so a short recap on a human metabolism so we can if we can produce energy in our cells in in, in the mitochondria and that can be done either from glucose or ketone bodies bhb or directly from fat but the, the last one there can only be done in muscle cells and particularly in the heart muscle cells so the and and the general um consumption of direct fatty acids from the bloodstream uh, is maybe 10 to 15 percent of our uh, total uh, metabolism during a day so it's just a minor part if you want to really burn fat and, and use your uh, your uh, use your fat uh, storage capacity uh, to energize brain and muscle you have to be in ketosis so lumen doesn't measure ketosis and ketosis is a, is a natural biochemical process in the in the liver cells where the liver mitochondria can metabolize fatty acids into ketones and one is the blood ketones beta hydroxybutyrate a little bit biochemistry here that can feed the brain and the muscle cells without any other extras without insulin without albumin it doesn't need anything it's the most natural type of energy uh, or, or fuel that can drive uh, cells all the cells of the body um, and what was that called butyrate did you say what was the name beta hydroxybutyrate but in the field it's called bhb or yes blood ketones that's easy mm -hmm. it's, it's the equivalent blood of ketones. blood gl glucose uh, and then there's a middle um, middle um, molecule called acetoacetate that falls into the urine and you can measure it with the urine sticks maybe you try that not very accurate and, and uh, not very uh, relevant, I would say. And the last part, the residual, the fumes of this hybrid engine that we're born with, if you're in ketosis, is acetone. Acetone is a free radical gas, falls into the blood. If you ever, you know, smelled on a nail polish remover bottle, it's kind of sticky and it's so, yeah. so it will be ventilated out through our lungs. It's not metabolizing anything else. You're not going to get acetone into your body other than being in ketosis. So it's a one to one connection for every fatty acids an acetone molecule falls out into the bloodstream and is ventilated out with a half life of 30 minutes through the lungs. And that's what we measure in parts per million. That's it. And then finally for food marble, as a matter of fact, we and Food Marble have just recently been selected by one of the biggest medtech companies in the world, Abbott, to be part of a challenge to de uh, determine, to have non-invasive methods to de determine your um, gut status and your microbiome. So uh, okay. what the more Food Marble, which is already in the market, our version of that is called Abdomatic. It will be more clinical. Uh, and it will be more possible to diagnose, for example, SIBO, if you've ever heard of that. Anyway, what yeah. they are doing and what we are doing is we're looking into uh, uh, digestive disorders based on primarily a little bit on leaky gut, but primarily based on microbiome that have migrated from the large intestine into the small. And when, the sm when those bacteria, which is really the large one, is in the small, they, when they meet glucose, they produce methane and hydrogen. Right. Why do they migrate? Uh, they migrate. That, that, that's a great question. Yeah. Well, that, that's, so if you're talking about SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that is uh, people, that's one of the fastest growing diagnoses for particularly women in Sweden right now in terms of gastric disease. 
uh, and maybe the answer to many of these more general irritable bowel syndrome um, diagnosis that people carry around. So the placebo, uh, why the migrate? It's we. I, I don't know. I'm not a doctor, but I do know that over time, over being feeding, being eating a lot of ultra processed food, fast carbs, and uh, uh, fructose, your small intestines eventually will not be able to to pick it all up so it will start falling into the large intestine so they are overfed there because they love glucose so then they you know kind of migrate they get too many there and they migrate from where the good stuff is coming from so they kind of migrate into the small intestine and when they're there which you're not supposed to be that produce gas gas belly it's really a that's a I, I have a theory that, that that these bacteria and things are kind of moving around because of light, because bacteria and mitochondria release light and, and they communicate with light. And I think if you get an area in the body where the mitochondria aren't working or you have a proliferation of these deleterious bacteria, that, that the, they move, the bacteria move to a place where there's more light for them. So, I mean, that's, uh, it's just very interesting how, you know, I'm just interested. That's why I ask why people think it's happening, because I've just made a product that actually shines near infrared light into the gut for oh, that yeah. reason. Yes. I think if you can get the infrared light through the gut, you can actually, if maybe you can target the mic, the actual bugs themselves. I'm not sure about that, but certainly you can target the mitochondria in the area so that they release more light to make it a place where the good bacteria can live. Exactly. I like that idea, and I, I do think this is, is this is something growing right now. It's something that is based on what's happening over the last maybe twenty years. So it's it's something related to our younger lifestyle, and and diet is not everything. Absolutely not. I mean, just the fact that we are we we, we live yeah we live very far from what we did twelve thousand years ago. That's for sure. And so uh, light, uh, especially uh, in exercise, Sweden, there's not yeah. an abundance of uh, no. Of and those I, I do think uh, gastric disorders are more common in in the northern region than, than than southern Europe at least, and it could be based on the diet, but it could also be based on uh, on other factors as well or a combination thereof. Absolutely. Yeah, light exposure. Yeah, for sure. And and I think even in places like where Russ is in California, I mean, they have a lot of light, but they also have a lot of blue light toxicity and they have a lot of wi-fi and and they have a lot of people just being indoors and not going out in the sun yeah absolutely that's very interesting i'm not an expert on red light but i do know it's important yeah yeah uh, there's um i i i'm very curious about uh kind of the rigors of of, of ketosis um and and i i find that when I'm in something, I'm pretty good at just staying committed and doing it. But I, but I feel like the rigor of ketosis is, is, is a little bit harder than other diets. And we've talked a little bit about, um, about this, but, but it's, it is a change of lifestyle. It's a change of sort of everything, uh, in, in, in how you consume. Uh, and now I think stores have been optimized. More food is available. That is kind of in line, but, but I wonder if there are, um, are things that you've done in, in your life to, to really help uh, make it less rigorous and make it a little bit easier and, and more of a, you know, a, a, a seamless thing. Cause it is easy to go and as Sarah will say, grab some crisps. I mean, it's very easy to go into my pantry and just grab a bag of chips cause there's nothing else in there. Or I am a sucker for those pretzel uh, with peanut butter inside. Like those, I'm terrible. I eat a whole bag of those in, in 10 minutes. So I don't know. Is there, are, are there, tricks to kind of keeping the, the the progress going yeah and it kind of ties to this other question sarah had so yeah I, this is my favorite question uh, i do think that in general i would say that we have decided not to have keto in our product name because the, the word keto has unfortunately been uh, kind of destroyed worldwide i would say keto comes from ketosis which is a natural process of the liver um of the liver cells in mitochondria there. This is a completely evolutionary natural thing to have um, for an omnivore. But but keto has been, um, you know, equaled with uh, carnivore. or or And keto, initially, the ketogenic diet comes from what we uh, give epileptic children, 
which is strictly 80% fat, 20% protein, no carbs. And that's an extreme diet. Any extreme diet is something you should be careful of. And I, I'm, I'm not pro any of that. I What I've learned and what our customers around the world, we're selling HX really around the world right now, what they are witnessing are that light ketosis is probably the best for you. And going in and out and metabolic flexibility. Do your cheating, but but you'll you'll, you'll try to get back. And, and and coming back to myself, living this life, not starting it, and not go, coming into this. I'm coming in it as a physicist, an entrepreneur, not not for a particular need. But I I feel I've come to this point where I'm never actually insulin hungry anymore. I'm I'm actually not ever hungry, even if I don't eat for 24 hours. I don't I'm not hungry like I used to. Because I never have high insulin levels. Not even when I cheat. When I eat crisps and I eat pizza, etc., maybe once every 14 days or so. Um, and then, you know, those glucose molecules that comes into my body, you know, the Celsius devours them and, 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 and I consume them right away. And then I'm back. You know, I can, I can cheat on the Saturday. I'm back on Monday. Uh, that's fine. But to reach that state, you have to be consequent for a while and not be extreme, but consequent. And my advice, and you know, if you want to live a long life, is to start skipping one meal and, and you know, take out gluten. Uh, that's, uh, and of course, uh, added sugar and, and sweeteners. Which meal? Uh, Which meal? You, you, yeah, that's very individual. I'm a night person. Uh, I never really liked uh, eating breakfast, and, and my co-founder and wife also is the same. Uh, but in general, men has easier to skip breakfast than women, but it's very good. And so I've eaten my last breakfast. That's what I said. I, I ate my last breakfast two years ago. Even if I'm at a hotel where it's free and everything and I slept, I don't, I'm not really hungry on anything before 12, any time. Have you done the, the studies, Anders? Have you done the studies using your device to see whether skipping breakfast or skipping dinner has a different effect? Uh, I don't think it has. It's the it's the length of the uh, it's it's the length of the fasting window. So so to me, I've I've ended up being at maybe eighteen six. I, I, my per perfect day is to eat two meals: one one at one o'clock and one at seven o'clock. That's it. And then in the morning, I have to say, I, I drink coffee with, 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 um, with, uh, with cream, not whipped cream, with cream and, uh, and coconut oil. That's what I eat. But I drink coffee with that. That's just to give me a little, and that also comes from the device that we have because we've, I've learned that you need to kind of prime the pump a little bit. Some dietary fat will also keep, get you into the, the own fat kind of ketosis. Uh, while if you don't prime the pump in the mornings, I tend to not, you know, burn as much, and then I become hungrier. So, yeah. It, and that that goes in line with what you said about yourself, which is you need that fasting time if you eat too late. So you probably need a good twelve hours, or maybe even longer, eighteen hours to fast to then get yourself uh, cleared. I, I I felt. When I was intermittent fasting, I felt that's when I felt the best, and I really have not reincorporated breakfast in. Um, I just I have a sugar problem, and my problem with sugar is that once I start eating it, I can I I have a really hard time kicking it, um, and it's and I started incorporating ice cream. Now I I hate ice cream. I am lactose intolerant, but yet I, I'm eating ice cream. I'm eating dairy free ice cream, so I have to kick sugar, and I think that that's step one. But kicking sugar takes me about a week. And once I'm a week in, I, I can look at sugar and be like, I don't need you. We're, we're, we're good. Um, but I'm wondering if there are, there are other culprits. I imagine like alcohol uh, is probably a tough thing to, to, to manage. I mean, how do you, how do you manage alcohol uh, yeah. with, with your device as well? Does it like spike you or, or not spike you? My, my second favorite question is, uh, so first of all, uh, some facts. We are the best animal on the planet to also metabolize alcohol. And that is for, you know, for a reason. We have built it into our evolutionary you know, evolution, probably because when we, again, were 
12,000 years, 20, 50,000 years back, we probably had to ferment things to survive. We have populated the entire planet, as you know, but most of us have been populating in, in the temperate zone. And there we have winters. So we have to survive winters, but we're not bears and can sleep all through winter. We're going to have to have energy. And we're very good at building fat during the f fall when the fruit and berry season. So we can easily put on weight, uh, fat, so that we can use it during the winter. But also to ferment and to, to um, um, we, 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 we're smart. We're the smartest animal too. So we're smart and we learned how to preserve uh, food simply uh, and that typically uh, means that alcohol is produced at some point uh, so we are built to metabolize alcohol we're actually better to metabolize alcohol we be metabolize ethanol better than fructose so we're even better at that and, and i typically to, to finalize this uh, thing if you don't have an alcoholic problem uh, as a middle-aged person man or woman it's much better to drink a glass of red wine or dry white uh, than a glass of coca-cola it's much, much more dangerous to drink the sugar. I'm sorry to say that, Russ. Uh, but the sugar, every fructose molecule you put in has to be converted by the liver into glucose. While alcohol is also produced into glucose. But we metabolize alcohol better than, when, than we do sugar. I wonder, Anders, if you could just briefly just go over the chemistry there, because you kind of mentioned a few things, things like, you know, insulin and, and how that relates to hunger and how that relates to breaking down all these sugars. Maybe you could just talk us through exactly how that works, because I'm sure everyone's had the experience of, you know, being starving, hungry after eating toast for breakfast or something. But how does that actually work? Yeah. And talking about satiety, uh, because that's what many of the, the, the ones talking about. How do you maintain satiety all the time? Yeah, how do you have that full up feeling? Because I, I mean, I I eat carbs and I seem quite happy on it, but I certainly don't have the full up feeling all the time. You know, by lunchtime, I'm ready for my lunch. So let's start with glucose. When you eat something with glucose in it, with fast carbs, it will immediately be sucked up by your small intestine and go into the bloodstream. It will raise your blood sugar level. Uh, and as soon as the blood sugar level goes up above uh, like 6 uh, millimoles per liter, it's preferably around 4.2, as you know. That's the best level. Um, uh, as soon as it goes up high, uh, the brain will tell uh, the body to release insulin because the insulin is needed to um, get the it, it needs an insulin molecule to open the door to the cell to get, let the glucose in. The problem is if you eat a, live a life of, of ultra processed food, high carbs and high sugar, eventually the insulin is like a door to door salesman selling vacuum cleaners. And it comes knocking on the door and saying, You want a vacuum cleaner? Yeah, put it in. Yeah. But then eventually the cell becomes energy poison. It's overloaded with glucose inside and glucogen and and maybe even blood ketones. They have all of the different vacuum cleaners inside. I don't know if the analogy on the vacuum cleaner is great, but after a while, so the, the, the blood sugar level goes up because the cells are not taking in the glucose. Uh, so then when the brain does, because eventually if you have high blood glucose level, that will make you blind, you will lose a limb, you will die. So the brain will say, this is unsustainable, let's release more insulin from the pancreas. So there is more door-to-door -door salesmen. Eventually you become insulin resistant. Uh, they shut the door permanently. So you will have permanently high glucose, blood glucose levels, uh, even if you don't eat that much carb, but because there, you know that you, you've got your cells tired of, of knocking on insulin. So, uh, and then um, uh, you drift towards diabetes type two. And diabetes type two, you start to get drugs to lower it, and eventually you will start to inject insulin to get even more in, even, if, even though you have a healthy pancreas. So. Uh, that's the that's the sad story of glucose. Uh, fructose quickly is we're not built to, you know, do anything with glucose. Uh, every fructose molecule and, and and a white sugar molecule consists of one glucose and one fructose. And fructose has to be broken down, especially in the U.S. where you have high high fructose uh, corn syrup and all of that. All of them needs to be treated just like an uh, ethanol molecule. So they they're just not. Um, they're just as bad as alcohol, except they're not addictive. Or maybe they are. We don't know. Let's not talk about sugar addiction. But And then fats eventually. I mean, we, we, there's also one great myth is all the fat we have on our body is built from glucose. Uh, 
this three glucose molecule is built into uh, into triglycerides. Uh, so so is, we, we, fat you eat from plants or or animals is not it has to be processed and has to be used as energy. It's, it's a myth that fat is going into our own fat. We we build our own fat, of course. So so yes, you know that. So fats doesn't need anything. It just needs you to get into ketosis once in a while, and that you do naturally, and uh, if you don't have high too high insulin levels. So, so when you eat a high fat diet, you know, a higher fat, lower carb diet, you're not you're not getting the insulin, and it's the, actually the insulin that's triggering the the feeling of being hungry. Yeah, yeah, it's insulin. It, it's not directly the insulin to other insulins, but the insulin is the culprit for that because insulin is used for fat storage also, and uh, and uh, so it's, it's really insulin is um, is the culprit here. And if you, as long as you have high blood sugar values and, and thus high insulin values, you can never be in ketosis. It's mutually exclusive. So you have to get calm in your body. You have to empty your, I mean, when you're starting this, we re typically recommend that you have a five dos days uh, kind of fasting or, or low calorie diet, uh, which we have one that we're selling here in Sweden um, as a course. For five days, you get, to, you get taught how to live on 750 calories per day and it's actually a vegan course it's not very much fat in it either it's just a lot of food but low calories and that's the starting point you need to do that and to burn out your glucagon storage and everything else and from that point when you start eating again after five days uh, more normally you could increase i wouldn't go uh, haywire on too much fat either because typically your um, digestive system needs to be adjusted to it too so i would just reduce the carbs from maybe being 50% of your total energy to um, 25. Let's put it that way. And then you replace that equally with protein fat. That's what I would do if I get started. But then don't uh, any I enemy mean, get stuck on, on how, again, it should be the same every day. It shouldn't. Try to, it's not dangerous to be hungry and try to, to uh, challenge your hunger. It's, we're, we're built for fasting, really. So uh, don't worry. Uh, and and then eventually you won't kind of, you're not going to die. You, you your body will tell you to eat something if it's really urgent, and uh, and it will solve itself. Yeah. Yeah, we've talked to a lot of people who have fasted for. Uh, we just talked to someone last week who fasted for eight days in a dark cave and was fine. Um, yeah, fa yeah, yeah. Fasting is is is. I I feel like fasting is actually needed and important. Um, I find that I do it every Monday, and it seems to really helped me sort of reset even after a, a long weekend. I, I don't drink alcohol, which is great. I, I've, I've heard it loud and clear um, about brain health from Sarah and others. I like my brain and I'm, you know, Sarah and I both turned 50 this year. And I think that's why we're so focused on longevity and anti-aging. Um, I'm wondering if this is, as we get older, uh, is this something we need to continue to do? Do we have to alter it as we get older? I think things like bone density, muscle, testosterone, things that we hear about, are there things that we have to keep in mind or add to our diet or even supplements if we're if we're um, getting into ketosis or the things that we should be adding as we get older because uh, maybe we're missing a few vitamins here or there or we're missing some of the supplements we need? Yeah, we're very individual, but there are certain things that I would recommend uh, differently for men or women that are middle-aged. Uh, but the first thing I would like to add is, of course, exercise. And exercise has nothing, for a middle-aged person, has nothing to do with your fat burning. I have to say that right out. There's no proof and it's just a myth that we should be bashing ourselves for not doing it. Exercise you should do for your brain health. Uh, you need that to release all those um, different uh, hormones that you come after you make an, a good exercise. Uh, and for your mechanical body, of course. Um, that's important and uh, as a matter of fact if you exercise too much it will just drive your hunger that it does that for me too so so uh, when i've lost most weight i've just kept um, eating two meals per day or one meal per day and not exercising too much as a side note so 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 exercise is my first thing um, the cortisol, eh? and if you, the if cortisol, you which... yeah and particularly middle-aged women should do um should do um uh workout uh train muscles uh arms um chest uh, back uh, legs but uh, you know weights 
um, that's that's uh, uh, that's just too rare uh, among middle-aged women. Uh, so that's that, and that will uh, you know feed the right type of hormones. And then uh, on top of that, uh, absolutely supplements. You go and get your blood tests. Uh, I mean, an extensive blood test, uh, maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, to see where you're at on your minerals, uh, both both men and women. Um, I know you can test your testosterone le levels, etc. But if you if you start eating better and exercise a little bit more, most men uh, naturally will uh, solve the testosterone testosterone uh, levels. Uh, that's my experience. Again, lifestyle uh, diseases are best treated with lifestyle changes, and then uh, but, but supplements absolutely. I would say supplements are needed, and then. Uh, you know, sunlight, go out and expose yourself to that. Do the little red light therapy. And, you know, all those biohacking things are, you know, most of them are really good. Uh, doing um, cold swims and all of those things are, we're built for that. We're getting to the end now, but I just want to ask you as an aside, as you're a physicist, have you started to look, because a lot of what you've said is biochemistry, it's, it's biology, most of what you've said today and how you're measuring things. But if you if you're kind of looking at it from a physics angle, you know things are slightly different. You know, like how the mitochondria works. You know how cold actually compresses the mitochondria and how light can be emitted from a mitochondria. These are all things which is phys which is physics. You know, I mean they call it biophysics now, but it's really integrating physics in biology. So have you been able to kind of take all of your learning from physics and and kind of put it into what you're doing. Do you look at it from that angle or have you kind of switched to look at it more from a biochemistry angle? I worked 21 years in cancer care. Diet wasn't mentioned once. This was between 92 and 2013. I think I'm saving more lives on cancer already now by telling people about diet rather than what I did then, to be honest. I'm sure, I mean, it's, uh, and it's again, uh, uh, yes, you know, looking at a, a solid tumor and the hypoxic part of it in the middle, and uh, which is driven by glucose, etc. But um, to answer your question, yes, when I approached this, I had to because I had to understand how do I measure acetone, first of all, in parts per million. So it was a physics approach, and where does the acetone come from? So I, I kind of looked at it at a mechanistic kind of view, uh, and, and then there was so much myths, myths about food and uh, human metabolism. What, what everything I've said here, I wouldn't say, it's based on first principle physics and first principle chemistry. It's based on what actually happens. It's based on what our human cells does or, or, or animal cells. They do it too, although not everyone is omnivore, um, but uh, we, humans are omnivore. Um, so um, yeah, I, 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 I kind of get tired of how the doctors look at it. I mean, a medical a doctor in, in Swedish med school, they have 12 hours of nutrition science. 12 hours in five and a half years. I think, it, yeah, I think it's the same for doctors the world over that they don't have training in all this lifestyle. And the dietitian, and the dietitians, the old one, the dietitians, you know, following the American and nutritional recommendations, I mean, you know, they're they're the worst, I would say, many times. Uh, not at all based, and 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 I said that in the previous podcast. But uh, most nutritional scientific papers, observational studies, up until ten years ago, were rubbish because they were just you know nonsense compared. If you look at pharmacological scientific papers or, or physics papers, not even mentioned. It's, it's just, but nutritional science has been come better. So I, I have a positive view of it right now. But beware that. Anyone can, anyone can, Barilla Institute can come up with a paper saying that pasta is the best thing that has ever been made. So. Well, I think really it's only recently we've had technology like yours. I think that's the difference. You know, one of those nutritionists who were doing their stuff 10 years ago, you know, they were either doing animal studies, which isn't really relevant to humans, or they were, they were testing with blood, which gives you a result which is possibly delayed and has implications so i think really the advent of technology like you're developing is gonna help the whole science move forward in a way where you can actually get a very accurate measurement just from doing something non-invasive and you can do it on a large scale so it's a combination of the, the what actually happens in the acid uh, 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 citric acid cycle really looking at how ATP is constructed. I've looked at that. I looked at it. It's chemistry, really. It's biochemistry, but it's chemistry at its core. This is what's going on over and over and again. So I'm not trying to be 
so opinionated about it, and then and then add common sense to that. So if you are a diabetic and you don't have insulin, it's probably better not to eat glucose. But that's not the yes. recommendation for a diabetic type one. They still eat glucose and then they inject to give all the money to Novo Nordisk to produce insulin. I don't know. I'm not going to be conspiratorial here, but but it's it, it's not common sense. If you don't have insulin and insulin is needed to get the blood the glucose out of the blood vein stream, don't eat glucose. Don't eat the sugar. Yeah, don't eat the sugar. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think you're right. It's common sense, but it's good to have your technology so that people can actually see it for themselves. Because I think that's the difference. You know, like you say, you're kind of guessing... Oh, with people think, oh, I don't know, one more chocolate bar, that's not going to make any difference. But if you can actually see the result and track it, you know, that's really what helps motivate people and really, really take responsibility for their own health, which is what we're trying to promote on this podcast, really. You are responsible for your health. Yeah, and I have get an aura ring also. Get an aura ring. Get get a, a continuous glucose meter and try it for two weeks just to see how your blood sugar levels is. Yeah, yes. Do the things like that, then you don't have to do it the same as you said with the, uh, something you said earlier, Russ. But but anyway, if you have had a track for a year or so, maybe you, you don't really need to measure every day any longer because you learn, and then you start you know kind of feel it. And 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 when you're in your sheet month or whenever you sheet. I don't use it either. I don't want to look at it. Just like when you're sheeting, you don't use your bathroom scale either. I mean, you come back to it when you're in, in, in the process. So it's a two. You don't need to use a hammer every day either. No. No, I, th- there is something that um, I, I was talking to a friend the other day, and we were – my relationship with food is um, – I have a psychological problem with food. I have a really terrible, toxic relationship with food. I use food as a – as an exit for stress, I use it as something that, um, I, you know, the thing about food that's different than other things, uh, is that it disappears. It's gone. You've, you've done it. You've, you've eaten it. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. So to Sarah's point about eating the extra candy bar, you don't actually know the impact of that. And, and, and sometimes I, I, I have such a, I don't know if it's a competitive nature in me. I, I was the oldest of, of another sister, like, I, I didn't fight for food as a child. I wasn't the youngest, but for some reason, I I am competitive with my food. I fight. I fight. I I I eat all the leftovers. I don't like. I don't. I don't know. It's. I I have a terrible relationship with food, and and I think maybe it all starts there. Of like, how do we redefine our relationship with food so that we respect it and it will respect us. And maybe I, there's something we need to do here. I, now I'm going to go down a vegan train. I'm not trying to do that, but, but there's something about um, having a better relationship with what we put into our bodies um, and knowing that it's doing something good for us versus always doing something bad. I don't know. I, I just, I, I'm a, ter- I, I have a terrible relationship with food and I have to sort of kick the habit and, and, and dump my toxic relationship. And you're not alone. I mean, Many have, uh, and uh, I would say it's it's also a kind of a motivational problem even before you go there. And many people get motivated because they have some kind of symptom that actually will reduce. People realize. Start, I think that uh, the COVID uh, uh, um, pandemic um, really got people thinking about. They've learned new words like excess mortality and. Uh, lifestyle risk factors and and people realize that wow how long i live is not just down to my doctor and my dna it it is too but it's you have a lot to do in that change and then you you, i don't know russ you 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 have to kind of get to the mental you have to be uh, enough motivated and right now when you eat that extra uh, ice cream jar uh you're not motivated other than that you have this podcast and this year of longevity thinking uh but but it, it, it's not going to help you in that moment uh because it's just too um vague i would say and that's very very common i, I feel the same it's just uh, i can cheat today and i can you know do this tomorrow instead yeah yeah well it's i it, and um anders where can we find your device? I, I see a couple of websites. I know that there's Diversify. Uh, is Should we go to Ace Track? Is that the name of the product? Get Ace Track. The name of the product is Ace Track, like racetrack without an R. 
but but that was taken. Astrack.com was taken when we started this five years ago. So uh, get Astrack.com, and uh, and you will have the exact link uh, buying it from 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 an English speaking area or German or whatever you are uh, in the show notes. But and then. Uh, uh, you will also have a, a discount code of 20% for your listeners. Uh, I don't know if we decided Rebel on what Scientist this is. 20. The Rebel Science 20. Yeah, that's what we decided on. So that will uh, be uh, also in the show notes. Um, and we're drop shipping all over the world. As a matter of fact, that was part of Ivor Cummins' uh, podcast um, uh, maybe uh, two months ago now. And that really kicked off sales all over the English-speaking world. So we sold a lot to New Zealand, Australia, thank you, uh, Canada, US, uh, a lot of things in Austin, Texas. I, th- I think that that seems to be a um, oh, med yes. tech hub. Uh, Alex. A yeah, I've never been to Austin. So. It's oh, a yeah. it's a biohacking hub. There, just all the biohackers from LA have moved there, and it's um, super cool. A lot more, so uh, yeah, and then in Ireland and in Scotland, yeah, places all over the world. Uh, and then, of course, our own uh, uh, initiatives where we are selling actively as, as, as the Swedish companies in Scandinavia and the German-speaking countries right now and opening up Portugal and, and Spain as well. But uh, to your listeners, uh, you know, go to show notes, find the link and, uh, and, and try, to, try to start with your lifestyle changes now and this will help you. Yeah. Start measuring so that you know what's going on and you have a baseline and you you have somewhere to go with it. You know, I think that's... And it's compatible with all kind of phones, Android, iOS. You just download the app, you register an account, and you start with your exhalation in seconds. So that's, that's the first measurement. My recommendation to anyone who gets one, start uh, by measuring three times a day. You're right in the morning when you wake up, before you brush your teeth, before you drink your coffee or whatever. And then uh, uh, before you go to bed, before you brush your teeth, because uh, any mouth gases will affect the, 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 the results. It's better that you haven't had anything in your mouth, no chewing gum or, or as we have in seed and snuff or anything else like that for at least 15 minutes before you make a, a measurement. And then one, maybe once uh, during the day, then before the meal, before lunch or before dinner, that could be worthwhile. And then you do that the same every day for a week and then uh, after a week you will start to be able to draw some conclusions yeah that's great yeah that's great thank you so much for coming on that Mm -hmm. was a real informative podcast Mm -hmm. thank you Uh, we covered a lot of ground there yeah Mm -hmm. so thank you very much and yes we will we'll give it a try and see if we can uh, increase our metabolic flexibility for longevity i'm sure that's the way to go yeah thank you great conversation thank you so much Thank you, Anders. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Breaking the crack.